Hey, Happy Friday. This week I tried Cowboy's fascinating new e-bike, Apple encountered perhaps their biggest legal challenge yet, and Nvidia built a new framework that makes it kind of really easy to make humanoid robots. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. <music> This video was sponsored by Insta360. We start the brief with Microsoft launching their new Surface Pro 10 and Surface Laptop 6 machines for business yesterday in probably the most underwhelming launch in a while. Both models have new Intel Core Ultra chips and slightly updated specs, plus a design that is now a little bit easier to repair, and that's it. Windows Central says that there will be a second Surface event in May where they will actually reveal all the things that are interesting, like the Qualcomm chips, the OLED screens, etc, etc. So that might be exciting, but this was kind of a bummer. Now, on the other end of the spectrum of being impressive was Honor, who launched the Magic 6 Ultimate as one of the first devices ever to run a tandem OLED display. This essentially means that the phone has two OLED screens stacked on top of each other. Combined, the two can reach 5,000 nits of brightness, while also making each panel individually less bright, so they claim that the power efficiency is up 40%, and the lifespan of the panels is also increased by 600%. Nice! Next, Qualcomm this week announced two new Snapdragon chips, including the oddly named Snapdragon 8S Gen 3, which is a cheaper version of the flagship chip, and also the Snapdragon 7 Plus Gen 3 in the mid-range spec. Moving on to Apple, we heard the rumor this week that the company is planning to partner with Google Gemini, or OpenAI, to power its iPhone AI features instead of building everything in-house themselves. Seeing how Google pays them tens of billions of dollars to be the default search engine on the iPhone, I guess they decided that, you know what, that's a pretty good place to be. Just let others do the work, sit back, and collect the cash. Not bad. And while we are at Apple, breaking news is that a supposedly unpatchable vulnerability was found in Apple's M1 and M2 chips. This vulnerability can leak secret encryption keys, and fixing it will, quote, take a major toll on performance. Apparently, the exploit is pretty hard to pull off, and you also have to have physical access to the device, so I wouldn't panic just yet, but yikes, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Next, Epic officially announced that the Epic Game Store is coming to both iOS and Android, bringing fees down to 12% versus Apple's and Google's 15 to 30%. Let's see if their mobile app stores will be just as bad as their desktop one, but I guess yay for competition. Meanwhile, Reddit this week became a public company after its IPO went live yesterday. It was priced at $34 a share, valuing the company at $6.4 billion, and at the writing of this video, the stock did really, really well. I wonder how much of that is just dudes in basements basically buying meme stocks, but uh, I guess congrats. And in weird news, a well-sourced rumor claims that Leica will release a new camera called the M11D, which will be digital but will have a completely analog-looking body, with a dial instead of a screen, and no way to check your photos until you sit down to a computer. Something for the people who just can't quite leave the film camera air behind, I guess. And finally, here's a fun one. A Formula One team boss at Williams was appalled to find that his team was using Excel to manage 20,000 car parts instead of a proper database or any sort of logistics management system. Ah, I guess Excel will just never die. Okay, and for my first story of the week, I tried the successor of my own e-bike, and I'm pretty intrigued. So the new Cowboy Cross and the Cross ST were revealed this week, and as someone who rides a cowboy daily, I think these might be the most interesting e-bikes of the year for me. Cowboy said that their users told them that they really wanted more comfort from their bikes, so they basically made the luxury SUV of European-style e-bikes. They added these really clean-looking fenders on the front that are upside down so that they can hide the cables better, they added suspension to the seat as well to keep your butt happy, and they designed even thicker tires too, which all together make the ride just ridiculously smooth. I tried it over cobblestones, curbs, and more, and it just rolled through everything with ease. Fun fact, the wheels are just thick enough to not actually fit into tram tracks, so you can just ride over them and nothing happens. I really like that. The rear rack is also better integrated now and can take 140 kilos despite this angled design, which is wild. They moved the light on the back so it's no longer obstructed by the stuff that you carry behind you. And they also switched to a more reliable supplier of brakes, which is perhaps the best news of them all because I had loads of problems with mine. 
Also, the removable battery is now 50% bigger and Cowboy still has what I think is the absolute smoothest engine and the best app in the industry too. But the downside to this design is that the e-bike is of course really heavy at around 27 kilos. Most of the components are completely custom, so you're really relying on Cowboy for repairs. And the bike is very expensive too, with an MSRP of 3,999 euros. Ouch. Now they have a pre-order discount of 500 euros and I also annoyed my cowboy rep until I convinced them to give me an extra discount with a code of 150 euros more on top of that, at least for the first two weeks or so, and that brings the price down to something a little bit more manageable. Still not cheap and the weight is quite something, but yeah, if you want to have a tank of an e-bike, the code is down in the description. Okay, for my second story of the week, the United States government looked at all the legal challenges Apple is having in the EU and said, how about we go further than that? <laughs> So the United States Department of Justice just launched perhaps the biggest case against Apple yet, even comparing this to the legendary Microsoft DOJ antitrust lawsuit from 2001. After a full five-year investigation, the DOJ made five main claims for Apple's monopolistic behavior. Blocking certain features of super apps so that they don't catch on outside of China. Suppressing mobile cloud streaming services so things like Xbox Cloud Gaming doesn't start to challenge the App Store. Undermining cross-platform for messaging apps to prop up iMessage instead, diminishing the functionality of non-Apple smartwatches to make sure that the Apple Watch and the iPhone work much better with each other than they do with any of their competitors, and finally limiting third-party digital wallets from using tap-to-pay functions and more. The 88-page document is also full of burns like, quote, Apple selectively compromises privacy and security interests when doing so is in Apple's own financial interests, and the DOJ complains about everything from the app review processes to green bubbles, etc. Spicy. They seem really serious, and just like with Microsoft, I guess we can expect a long series of court hearings and then maybe some big rulings at the end. It's gonna be a spectacle. Okay, and for my third story of the week, Nvidia hosted its biggest launch event in years, and while everyone was busy focusing on the chips, I think the most interesting thing that they announced was actually about robots. So on the chip side, the main news is a new Blackwell GPU that powers a bunch of their new AI accelerators. They claim that it is four times faster than the previous H100 chip, and once it is put into a data center with their new ultra-low power NVLink chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, it can do the same jobs for 25 times less cost and energy consumption than the H100 as well. That is huge. But it is Project Groot, named after the character from Guardians of the Galaxy, I guess, that actually caught my attention. This is a foundation model for humanoid robots and a system that teaches them to learn skills on the fly. Nvidia uses physics-based environments and lets simulated robots stumble around in those to learn from their own mistakes first. Then they use videos captured of humans, which the AI learns to process and imitate, first as a digital simulation and then in the real world as well. And then they also showed off a teleoperation, where a human remotely controls a robot, for example with VR controllers, to simply show it how to perform a specific task a few times, which the robot can then learn to replicate for itself. So the robots are taught to basically imitate humans and then experiment in a digital environment, and because we have so much data on how humans move in general, and because machine learning systems can now process that, NVIDIA says that it will potentially be easier to make complex humanoid robots now than it is to make other simpler types that scientists actually have to code from scratch. That is crazy. And others seem to agree. There's also the OpenAI-powered robot from Figure that made waves by being really impressive and by its company raising $675 million from many big investors. There's of course also the Tesla robot, which in a way started this whole new gold rush and a couple of others. Seems like robots are back in vogue again. And if you are excited about clever little robots doing some of the work for you, then check out this adorable robotic webcam. Oh no, wait, that's the wrong webcam. That's from my MacBook Air. Let's try this again. Oh yeah, that is much better. This is actual footage from a real webcam sitting on top of a motorized gimbal. And if I want to, I can get it to follow me around physically. And if I want that to stop, I can just hold up my hand and it will stop. How cool is that? 
I'm talking about the Insta360 Link, of course, which is a webcam with a massive half inch 4K sensor that gives you superb image quality, a motorized gimbal, and also AI tracking that makes it super versatile. You can simply control it with your hand gestures, such as showing your palm, which will tell the camera to stop or start tracking you. You can make it go into portrait orientation to record vertical 4K videos for you aspiring TikTok stars. You can create a QR code from inside the desktop app, which you can then scan with your phone. And if you are on the same Wi-Fi, it automatically opens up a website to remote control your camera without even having to download a new app. You can make the camera look down to record your desk, where it will even do perspective correction so that everything looks good. Or you can just make it go to sleep like this when you don't use it. Really fun. The whole thing just plugs in with a single USB-C cable and the fantastic companion app lets you control everything and even save preset positions if you always want to return to a certain setting. Really cool and even the microphones on it are really great. You're listening to the built-in microphones of the Insta360 Link right now without any processing in a pretty echoey room. I think they sound pretty great, especially for a webcam. And so especially if your computer doesn't have any microphones at all, maybe you have a desktop PC or something like that, then these will do double duty. There's also a tripod that you can use to prop up the camera on its own. And with my link in the description, you can get both the tripod for free, as well as a 20% discount if you are one of the first 20 people who order. So check the link, be quick if you want to get the discount, and I'll see you in the next video.